production and um, thank the organizers for this um, beautiful event. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this first part of the talk, well, sort of, I could go through kind of quickly because we already um, had a wonderful introduction by Mahalis on the first day to sort of the uh, the problem will be cosmic censorship and even a lot of definitions of naked singularities. But this will still we can sort of. Uh, It'd be nice to just have a quick, quick review. All right. Okay. So we already heard um, again on the first day that we cosmic censorship is the statement that you start with nice data. Um, all right, which is a sort of asymptotically flat data. Then of course singularities can emerge, but we expect them to be um, stuck behind a black hole. So if you don't want to deal with them, you sort of don't have to deal with them. That's the idea. All right. So this um, at least some version of this conjecture goes back to um, Penrose. Um, but at the time, it's sort of interesting to note at the time, there wasn't really sort of, uh, say, a great reason that it should be true, other than, of course, it was consistent with all known examples and maybe and then some wishful thinking. And it's really only from this work of Chris Adulu, which we again um, now has sort of mentioned already uh, briefly, um, this work in, in the 90s for the spherically symmetric Einstein scalar field system that there was, that we even had sort of an idea why this conjecture might be true of vacuum. Um, okay, that's great. Um, and also, we've also seen sort of hints of this in various talks, and we'll um, probably uh, hear more about it, for example, in Maxime's talk, that as with other um, important questions in general relativity, um, the, you know, exactly what you decide regular to mean, um, you know, is in principle very important. Okay, so, uh, okay, so here, um, so just to be concrete, um, let's hear sort of a definition of singularity, and I'll draw this picture over here so that I can refer to it later. Um, so singularity space time as a naked singularity, um, which sort of arises from regular data if the following happened. Right here. Um, all right, so again, so, okay, I guess in Mahalis' talk, most things were phrased in terms of space-like data, but it's, um, it's not really a big deal to, um, to, to say everything in terms of having nice characteristic data. And if we have such space time arising from nice asymptotically flat characteristic data, um, which ends in a singularity, um, then we say that singularity is naked if you can find a sequence of um, ingoing uh, null geodesics, which you can sort of, you know, parallel transport them arbitrarily far out into the asymptotically flat region. But no matter how far out you go, when you sort of go, you know, in the transversal direction for time one, you take the light cone of the singularity, right? Um, and so somehow, no matter how far out you go, you have to stop doing physics and sort of time one. Um, and also, I guess maybe wanted to say, even though um, Mahalis already insisted that we all have nodding familiarity with Penrose diagrams. Um, just in case you were sort of lying when you said that you had that analysis talk. Um, just, just quickly, you know, and when these pictures sort of up as kind of time you want and sideways, you should think you can think of as an R coordinate from like sphere, spherical coordinates, R theta phi. And this and this picture, which will sort of, you know, be the main relevant picture for the whole talk, you should think that this, this line corresponds to R equals zero spherical coordinates. So, you know, you kind of grab grab the picture of the singularity and rotate it around. And that's kind of a better way to think about it. Okay, so any, that's clear. Yeah. All right, great. So let's, um, again, I'm going quickly just because uh, we, we heard some analysis about this stuff. All right, so let's just say in a little more detail what, what Chris Sedula did. So he, um, all right, of course, the motivation is the vacuum, but um, the idea is that the, you know, the metric in relativity is wave-like, so a reasonable sort of um, matter model to consider in spherical symmetry might be a scalar field. We expect that that gives us a good intuition. Um, all right, and the main results, as we heard before, were that, okay, somewhat surprisingly at the time, there do exist naked singularities for this model, but generically, um, sort of they're non-generic. So generically, they don't occur. So that's sort of, that's that's good enough for a weak cosmic sensor. <laughs> Um, all right, and though it's not really going to be relevant 
for my talk, I should also mention that, you know, uh, sort of a parallel development in the 90s um, is there's an enormous sort of heuristic and numerical literature about naked singularities, which are associated to uh, critical phenomena. But it feels rare to not mention that, but it actually won't really play a role. Okay, so again, we'll do, we'll have a quick aside about regularity. Again, I'll be quick because also Mahalas already talked about, but it's important enough that I wanted to say it again. So these, in Chris Adulu's framework, these naked singularity examples do not have smooth data. Okay. And moreover, when if we have a naked singularity, um, Chris Adulu shows that we can perturb it and, and make the naked singularity go away. But the, pertur the perturbation we do is not smooth. Right? Um, however, it's sort of at least in the, the standard story that we tell ourselves is that this is justified because it's sort of the, the functional framework is good enough. It's sort of, among other things, the framework that he uses, there is a well-posedness result, but, but it's not even just a well-posedness result. There, there, there are various um, good properties that the um, Einstein scalar field system has here. Um, all right, so that's fine. But, but it is worth emphasizing that, that it's quite interesting to revisit even in spherical symmetry, um, both the existence of naked singularities and the, um, and the, their instability. Um, and again, I wrote here in the smooth category. So maybe, maybe you might think maybe smooth category is a bit exotic, but or something. But maybe you know C two is actually already very interesting. Um, just just to sort of in the category of classical solutions, um, I think it would be quite interesting to revisit them. Okay, great. So despite this um, this work and in, in, in the nineties until the stuff I'm going to talk to you um, today. There wasn't really progress in constructing naked singularities um, for the vacuum equations, and it's not really difficult to explain why. Um, okay, so you can look. You can go and you can look at Chris Adula's, uh paper where he constructs them, and the key, and we've all this is also we've um, we uh, we've seen um, uh, versions of this in, in, in Jeremy's talk, um, and well, and also in Juhi's talk that there it was not autonomous. Um, the key was a reduction after suitable um, type of self-similarity to a, um, a two-dimensional okay. autonomous system, which, um, well, we saw in Jeremy's talk that those could still be tremendously complicated to understand, but somehow there are a lot of tools you have. And um, if you work hard enough, sometimes you can. And anyway, so somehow it's there that Chris Adulli found this naked singularity. Um, okay, but for the Einstein vacuum equations, there's no such reduction kind of that you can do that's consistent with asymptotic flatness. So somehow you have to start from scratch as far as, as the, those techniques are concerned. Okay, and then, so if you're going to um, do something else or to try to construct things dynamically or, or whatever, you have the usual story that there's sort of simultaneously, there's some kind of low regularity, there's a singularity floating around that makes things hard. Um, but What's important is that you have to solve, you know, you have to construct this whole picture, right? So this is sort of, maybe it's not quite correct to call it a global problem. Maybe there's a semi-global aspect to this, even though, you know, some things probably have to be large, you know, there's a singularity. So that, that sort of gives the problem its characteristic um, flavor. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense. All right, yeah. all right, and so, but despite, these difficulties, the main the theorem I want to tell you is that, that these do exist so this is a, as a combination of two results, one the, the first of which um, is joint, joint with Igor. And I guess you heard about last night, um, even though I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss the, um, the, uh, the, ma the main ideas behind, behind the proof of this. And then I'll, and I'll try to slow down a bit now since it's weird. We've left the uh, stuff that we, we've sort of already heard. Okay, so all right. So the first um, part of this is going to be sort of presented as if it's a bit um, not actually again somehow it's a bit ahistorical uh, in terms of how we actually uh, came to this. But the idea would be if you wanted to construct, you're interested in constructing naked singularity, and, and your goal was to well, you know, how can I find an analog of, of what Chris Sedulu did? Sort of what what's the thought process you would go? How would you end up at our, at our construction? So what's the idea? So we want to look for a solution, which is going to um, you know, have some kind of self-similarity. So that should mean it has a conformal killing field, dilation symmetry. Uh, okay, it can mean that the Lie derivative with respect to this vector field of the metric is two, is two times G. That's just the usual, usual formula. All right. 
course, if you want to sort of, you know, uh, do something interesting from PDE perspective and relativity, you usually have to pick some kind of gauge. For lack of any sort of better idea of what to do, we'll, um, we'll work in, uh, you know, so-called double null gauge. Um, and moreover, you know, of course, any, any space time can locally be equipped with some coordinates like this. Um, Maybe again, if you, because uh, okay, many people are maybe not super familiar with the, with these coordinates, maybe the the you know really the only thing to mention is that the point of this is that the so there's a u function, a, a v function, and some thetas. The hypersurfaces of constant u and constant v are null hypersurfaces. So that you're you have these families of null hypersurfaces in your space time, which in the picture we just draw diagonal lines, and where they intersect, they're spheres covered by this theta. So you can always at least locally pick some coordinate system like this. Um, what's, you have no idea though, just because you have a, a conformal killing field, there's no reason to think that conformal killing field takes any particular form in a double null uh, gauge. But somehow, again, for lack of any better idea, let's just, just get started. Let's assume it takes a simple form, ud by du plus vd by dv, which is the form that, it, that say the normal dilation symmetry takes on Minkowski space, right? Though it may be more familiar be written as t d by dt plus r d by dr, but that's the same, all right? Okay, and then um, maybe just to make things really concrete, so 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 again, we have these. There are these pieces of the metric. These are the unknowns. Self similarity. So, okay, usually these would be functions of u, v, theta, because of the self. This this particular field is self similar. If you just write out this 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 equation and coordinates you get that these functions sort of you know instead of being you know it, well i guess maybe the more usual thing would be things become functions of t over r again i'm working with these null coordinates so things are functions now of v over u um then you have the, the theta and, and you know based some scaling considerations kind of tell you what this power of u should be outside okay so that's all great um so now I guess what you know you could do is you could plug this into the Einstein equation, see what you get. Of course, it's it will be a sort of a horrible mess and not necessarily clear how to get started. Um, but there's one sort of well, there's if you think about it a bit, there's kind of a natural place to sort of start, which is um, the following. So kind of well, let's say at least the, my, my favorite part of the Einstein equations is the is the equation, which is of course responsible for the um, famous Penrose incompleteness theorem, or I guess, or singularity theorem, depending on who you ask. Um, this is an equation along null hypersurfaces. Okay? In particular, there is um, a Rajaduri equation which holds along the V equals zero hypersurface. So why, why am I emphasizing that? Because if we look at these, these formulas here, if you put V equals zero, then this, this is just zero here, right? V equal, they, these, these parts of the arguments go away and you just basically get functions on, on the sphere theta. So, if you have an equation which holds really a long V equals zero, that means this will, you're going to get an equation just on a sphere here. That's kind of nice. That's a more simple thing to look at. Okay. I mean, it's not clear that that's going to be useful, but okay, at least it's something simpler than the other stuff. All right. So if you, um, you work that out, you get, okay, you get some equation. It still looks kind of complicated, but this, so this is an equation along a given sphere. Um, on this hypersurface. So these, okay, there's all this notation I haven't really introduced at all, but th these divergence, there's some trace-free gradient. These are things defined with respect to whatever the induced metric is on that sphere, all right? Okay, so that, again, that doesn't maybe look so sort of relevant. It's some equation, that's great. But there's something sort of surprising about this, which is that it turns out that even though, th that there's actually a lot of rigidity in this system. And again, it, it has something to do with that famous monotonicity in the Rajaduri equation. So this, this the monotonicity, is this square term here. Um, and somehow there's some tension between that term and the fact that divergence wants to integrate to zero, okay? And somehow, again, it's, it's not so obvious, but it turns out you can show that there's, there's a lot of rigidity here. This is sort of very hard to actually satisfy. And basically this B vector field has to be sort of killing with respect to, to um, whatever your induced metric is. And it also has to, this B derivative of this function omega has to be zero. So somehow there's a lot of rigidity. Then you can go even further, and I mean it's not, um, it's not completely trivial, but it turns out you can show that once you've done that, you can actually, if you had a self-similar solution, you could do some coordinate change, which maintained the form of the gauge, maintain what 
that the vector field killing field, the conformal killing field looked like UDU plus VDV. And so that you end up with this kind of um, that along V equals zero again, this one particular hypersurface, everything kind of takes the trivial values, just the values it takes on Mikowski space. Yeah, come out of curiosity, these things you're saying now, how particular are they to dimension three plus one? Uh, it's extremely. Um, yeah, so particularly this, this you know, when you do this, you use, you'd use uniformization. So you're going to use that every metric on this on S2 is uh, some factor um, times the round, the formal factor times the round metric. And then somehow you can, you know, by then tilting how you slice the cone, you can make it a, a round metric. So it's extremely three plus one. Um, okay. Um, and then, yes, as the final sentence even says. There's a special rigidity to uh, associate to three plus one problems. All right, so that's great. So again, so maybe let's just go back here. All right, so so what we said is, so when we plug in V equals zero here, we basically, everything is trivial. So then again, if you don't really have any, um, if you still sort of don't have an idea how to proceed, the next maybe naive thing to do would be consider some kind of maybe formal power series expansions in V over U, right? And, and try to sort of see, see what's going on. What, what's, what's free, what's not. Okay, um, doesn't look particularly pleasant, sorry to do, um, but then fortunately, um, when you realize that someone already did this for us, so that, that's kind of nice. Um, all right, which, which, which is a bit of a sort of surprising story, which I don't really have time to go into fully, but um, in their search for um, conformal invariance, for some reason or another, Pfeffer Minogram ended up studying formal power, well, okay, they studied it, this problem in a different gauge, but if you can translate it to the double null coordinates, and if you do that, you'll find that it exactly studied formal power series expansions for metrics like this. Um, okay. In reality, they were interested in higher dimensions, uh, mostly, but they did they did the three plus one case for sort of completeness, and, and that's what we'll look at. And what they find sort of is interesting is that, um, well, you, you can do this, and basically the everything is determined. There's, there's one particular component in these formal power series expansions that you get to pick. This is the trace-free part of a certain derivative in V of this. This is the, whatever, the, the details of that are not important. It's some first order quantity is, is free and then everything else is, is fixed. And they, they worked all this out. It's, it's, not, not, it's, uh, it's, not, it's totally non-trivial, non but we can exploit their, their understanding. Okay, so that's great. Um, all right, and again, like I said, they're mostly interested in higher dimensions in reality. All right, so again, just to orient ourselves, maybe here you should think these are power series and sort of V over U. So that corresponds in this in the Penrose diagram language to such a region like this. Remember, you can grab the top, move it around. So you have sort of pressure. Okay. So the um the first place, the first time sort of Igor and I became interested in this stuff was actually trying to understand when these formal power series solutions corresponded. Uh, to actual solutions. And um, so this is the first thing we did is that, well, basically they do, um, at least if you're on the correct side of this cone. And um, so where's that this that issue of side? That's to be if anybody, I don't know where I put the chalk. Um, there are people who have studied self-similar solutions in other contexts. This is easy to explain what's happening. So it's just, so if you're self-similar, at least in the, Usual problems, say um, in PDEs, you have some place of the, the center of the dilation symmetry. You can look at the past cone of that. And usually outside of this cone, your problem is going to be hyperbolic, right? This is where you usually, right? This is where the K, your, this field is space like, right? And then usually things would be elliptic here. Maybe let me put a question mark here. This would correspond to K being time like. Right. And so it's only, and so in this, this corresponds to the regions where the self, you expect the self-similar equations to be hyperbolic. And that's why we sort of, um, and then sort of from general, uh, and, and just on the basis of general PD theory, that's where you sort of would expect all of the solutions that actually could um, possibly make sense. Okay, anyway, we did that. Um, okay, that's fine. We actually did something a little more, um, which is we, we, we also studied the problem where you kind of, you can, wiggle things a little bit so you can take a null hypersurface sort of coming out the other way in this transversal direction and you can sort of wiggle that data a little bit and we prove that um the corresponding solution sort of shares many of the same qualitative characteristics 
In particular, as you zoom in on this singular point, you are asymptotically similar to a self-similar solution. Um, again, the details of this aren't too important. I just want to um, just just want to point out that there's some kind of theory which it, it's a little it's ro more robust than just that there exists a self-similar solution. So we've saw, we've seen, I guess, in in, in both Jeremy's and Judy's talk that it, it's sometimes useful. For example, you know, you might think if you use a self-similar solution to construct some kind of asymptotically flat counterexample, you might need to truncate it or things like. It's just useful to be able to kind of wiggle your solution a bit and have the um, basic features persist. Um, okay, not that you'd actually need this there for the truncation. Um, okay, everything makes sense. Um, all right, but okay, of course, I drew this picture at the beginning because it's important to keep in mind. So. Uh, when I, and I tried to emphasize at the beginning that naked singularity is a global notion, right? This is something just, this just came from under, you know, these started with these power series. So this is very local. So this is very far from anything to do with the naked singularity. Um, there's sort of, and there are two issues. You have to go out, you know, you, you, you have to go to the past of the cone. You'd have to extend the solution somehow and to the future of the cone. So you have a solution, sorry, and then you, you just know it's self-similar in that region. Um, in this this case, it's not going to be exactly self-similar because this data is basically anything, but it's, it's it, asymptotically it's self-similar in that region and outside of that region, you, you lose control of whether. Well, it's not even. This is just. It's. Oh, well, I guess. Yeah, we don't make any statement about about. Um, there's no statement outside this region. Yeah. Make sense. Yeah, but it's just a little piece. It's it's sort of. Um, uh, yeah, and I guess I forgot to say. It, you know. Anyway, maybe it's not so important. You you can. You can even read off from this data what sort of self-similar solution you're going to converge to. That's not too important. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to say is okay. So now let's entertain the possibility of using it to try to create that kind of global picture. Um, all right. Well, there's an issue. So, which is kind of annoying. So it turns out that basically the only natural way to do that is to put something completely flat inside, and the quickest way to understand why that is, so I told you basically that the geometry along V equals zero, exactly the values of the metric on V equals zero are trivial, right? And then if you believe that to be some kind of elliptic problem, you know, this kind of like you're solving some elliptic problem and there's trivial boundary data. So make, so it's maybe plausible that there's some kind of rigidity there. Yeah. Um, and, and this is sort of annoying because you might also remember the Pfeffer and Graham, you know, had this general formal expansion. And they basically, they said, that everything is determined by some quantity at the level of the first transversal derivative of the metric or this dv of something. It was not important what that dv was. But so if you have something completely trivial here, if you want to have something be non-trivial in general, you better, it needs to be non-trivial here or else it would just all be flat space. But from the Pfefferman grand calculation, you know that it means that dv has to be non-trivial here. So dv has to go from zero to something non-zero. So the derivatives jump, right? And and basically, there's just absolutely no sense in which, you know, the data, these solutions are interesting, but there's no sense in which the singularity at the uh, origin of dilation um, symmetry is, it's not any more singular than what you started with. It's just, this, in fact, it just corresponds to a, I think it's a spherical, a, a, an impulsive wave with the spherical front, you know, collapsing. It's an interesting object, but it's not um, relevant for uh, singularity formation, per se. Another way to think about why it's sort of not, um, you shouldn't think of it, this, you shouldn't think of this singularity as being so interesting in this case, because sort of any, you know, I don't know, a more, more philosophical statement, any sort of causal observer who, who goes here is, is only gonna see sort of flat things. It's sort of, they, they don't, it's just a trivial geometry. They don't see anything interesting. Okay. Um, so this is sort of an aside, but, but I think, so this assertion I made about this rigidity is kind of, it's I think it's heuristic. Um, certainly there's no natural way to um, put something there. I think it's kind of interesting to try to formalize that. I don't know how exactly what the right, right notion is. It's sort of has some similar flavor to other rigidity problems in relativity. Do you expect to form a black hole when you collapse this spherical wave or? Um, well, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's not clear, yeah, so the, What's interesting is to ask what happens if you have a small, if you if you put a very small jump here. Yeah. So it's so in the in for the scalar field system, the analogous thing is global. So in other words, the it comes in, it bounces, and actually you get something flat up here. 
Um, but it's not so that if you were that's kind of the optimistic conjecture, but it's not it's not really clear. Yeah. Well, I should say you, you if it's what you'll definitely exist up to this hypersurface that you can prove, but it's not clear exactly what happens here. Other questions? You know where the trap surface? You also don't know where the trap surface is. Or... No, there'll be no trap surface. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, I guess you asked me specifically if a black hole forms. Yeah, you know that there's no trap surface in, in for the small jump, but what's not clear, what, in sphere, what happens in the spherically symmetric situation is that this cone is also sort of trivial. Um, so it's specific, the hockey mass, for example, vanishes on that cone in the scalar field case. And so the analog would be, um, you have this trivial cone here, you exist up to here, is this cone also after coordinate change, like, uh, is it a trivial sort of um, trivial cone? Other questions? Okay, so that's fine. Okay, so we sort of have to start over. Okay, but um, so we, we we see we kind of have to give up on this. Um, of course, we made some assumptions at the beginning. I mean, I picked a particular gauge. I assumed some particular things about what the conformal field looked like in that gauge, and I and I I tried to emphasize that, that there was no reason to do that. That was just for lack of any better idea. Okay, so let's um kind of revisit those assumptions. All right, so. Here's sort of a, a separate kind of picture of the of the Pfefferman Graham geometry. So we have our our uh, source of the dilation symmetry. We look at the past light cone of it, and and the point is that so I've sort of drawn these straight lines. Say are the null the null null geodesics along this light cone. This conformal for all these Pfefferman Graham geometries, the conformal kill just coincides. It points in the same direction of these null. So it's just if you grab you. Up this cone, you just slide up the thing. You see your rescaling of the. You just see the round sphere just rescaled. Um, but there's sort of kind of this natural thing to to think of, which is well, there's no reason that 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 sort of has to happen like that. Why, why couldn't it be the case that you know my conformal field twists around the cone? Right? In other words, so if I if I just slide up, I have to apply a diffeomorphism on this the metric on this cut before I see again a rescaled cut. It's kind of again. This is quite, um, I think maybe the, the simplest analogy is in lots of uh, geometric flows. There's often some kind of, uh, there's a kind of, uh, you have some definition of self-similarity in the usual way. And it's usually important to also consider sort of self-similarity coupled to a diffeomorphism. That, that's, that's often important. So you, you, this is, you can make some kind of analogy for that. Um, okay, but somehow you clearly, you know, there was all this rigidity and, and all of this. So, so if you're going to somehow capture this, you have to change something, right? Um, all right, so let's explain. And I'll explain the simplest version of, of how this rigidity can be broken. All right, so again, same coordinate system, same vector field setting, okay? That doesn't look so promising maybe. Um, but now the th weird thing we're gonna do is we're going to allow this, um, this lapse function this omega, we're going to allow it to be singular, which of course looks strange because we're worried about regularity. But um, the point is, as we all know, in, uh, in general relativity, it, you know, you're allowed to change coordinates, right? So, um, so the idea is, in, in those original coordinates, we can entertain the idea that the omega is singular, right? You have v to the minus the minus kappa, but then sort of there's some regular coordinate system where you you rescale v. And then you can make this quantity pops out, and then this is regular, right? Of course, the price you pay is that in the regular coordinates, self, the self-similar vector field will look different, and that means that all the formulas and stuff from self-similarity are, you know, not the usual ones. And so that's so sort of it's a sort of in practice you kind of one tries to work in these coordinates as much as possible and just keep in mind that there's going to be this this other system where things are regular, sort of like how in Schwarzschild. The easiest coordinates to calculate with are not the ones which are regular on the event horizon. Kind of like that. Okay, this is the simplest version of this process. They're they're um they're also more complicated. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see what happens when you do this. Um, you can recompute that that same uh you get the right to jury equation again becomes an equation of the sphere. Everything basically is the same, but what pops out is this 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 kappa here. 
Um, and basically, that's great because I I believe what I told you before, the issue was sort of that there's a divergence on this side, which wants to integrate the zero, but there's something positive, which doesn't want to integrate to zero. But now you can sort of pick this kappa so that this, this is sort of a free parameter. You can make this integrate to zero and kind of there's no, somehow now there's no rigidity here. And so you can find, you know, now it's really just an equation which determines divergence of B and you can find every, everything else is basically free. Right. And then finally, we can uh, sort of do the analog of what we did before. We can embed this more complicated geometry into a natural space time, again, still just in a small region. Right. In this case, okay, for this talk, I won't, um, well, maybe at the, the end when I, when I talk about the proof a bit, I'll um, say something about this. But okay, one thing is important is that now it's not, it's really, it's, it's, there's some, when you put sort of, data here that you expect to sort of then be asymptotically self-similar, there's some matching conditions, there's some compatibility conditions which have to hold or these hyperservices. But other than that, it's, it's, it's quite similar. And so, yeah, imposing a twisting killing field like that forces the metric, the space-time metric at the origin to have non, some non-smoothness. Um, yes, though- the, How much, um, just, just that requirement forces well, what? No, okay. There's not a formal statement that, that I can give to you. One, um, but, but it is true. You can't, I mean, if you, if the metric was C2 smooth, you could not have such oh, a killing. Okay. Yes, certainly it's not smooth, but so what's the I, I, well, what's the, okay. One can make conjectures. I, the, the sort of, the information one has strongly suggests that it's some kind of C0 type singularity at that point. That would be my conjecture, but there's not a, um, some formalization of that, some, something at the level of the metric. C0. So the metric fails to be C0 in some sense. Okay, okay. You, that doesn't make sense. With the, I would have thought C1. The point right. is not in the space time, but I, that's what okay. that would be. My conjecture is that it's something like that. Certainly that's, that's the right scaling. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay. So, um, so that's fine. So we're back. We're we're back in this local picture. So now, but now I have to talk about, um, you know, if I'm going to prove this theorem, I promise you, I have to deal with, uh, I have to deal with these regions, right? Okay. Um, but okay. But maybe first, yeah. Let me make this slight aside, though. Possibly is a sort of TMI. Anyway. Um, it's possible that you can, uh, it, it's actually, there's, it turns out there's actually kind of a, um, some more general, you know, I gave, I gave a very simple example where the regular coordinates you could just sort of do by hand with this V rescaling, but it turns out you can try to sort of systematically study, um, you know, geometries that have some kind of twisted uh, self-similarity, at least, okay, you're going to need some kind of smallness assumption, but let's, you just consider, I have a space time, some kind of conformal thing that's twisting and assume that in some sense it's this twisting is only you know epsilon simple sense um in that setting you can establish some kind of theory which is very similar to Feferman Graham's formal theory so you can have you have some kind of formal expansions you can understand exactly the free terms and, and what's not free et cetera et cetera and that um that might if I have time that that's sort of uh I'll explain one, one reason you might be interested in that. there's some kind of general thing going on you should think it, it's not usually as simple as just rescaling the all right, so now let's go to the, to the globalist issue. Okay, so first let me state the theorems and then, and then, I'll, and then I'll talk about it. So, so the first result, um, which is joint with, with Igor, um, is that we can extend this to, to, to an exterior. So you can take, so maybe this point I'll draw here. So before what we had done was a little piece like this. You know, we put some data here, we have a little tiny piece. So it's possible to extend this data to some asymptotically flat cone in such a way that you can sort of um, construct the full sort of exterior region that you want to be there. So the solution exists up to the light cone here, nothing goes wrong before that. Um, again, I'll say something more in a bit. In general, why are you worried? What, what, why should you think that this might be hard to do? Because you would expect that since, you know, there's some, this is, if this is a singular, somewhere something's probably large, you know, we know, 
uh, if everything was small, then you know the Minkowski space is stable, right? So there's there's some largeness here, but you have to overcome that. You're going to have to overcome that largeness to to understand this sort of semi-global existence result. So that's what you should think is the obstruction that I kind of owe you a reason why the largeness doesn't destroy everything. I'll, I'll say something briefly about that um, in a few slides. Oh, um, right. And then okay, and then in the other direction, um, we have uh, the construction of of the All right. Um. And I'll say, and I'll, I'll say some, some things about that. Um, okay. All right, so let's, um, before I talk about, I'll give, talk about some aspects of the proof. Um, let me uh, just talk about, compare with Chris Adulu, talk about the, the more detailed uh, features of this. So the first thing to talk about is the regularity. So our solutions, so as I said at the beginning, the solutions are, are, not, are not smooth. Like Chris in fact, they're not even C2. I mentioned some sense. It's not so much, uh, you know, already doing things in C2 for Chris in, in Chris Adulu's setting is quite interesting. Um, and, and the story is very similar for us. So our the solutions are um the first derivative is, is holder continuous. The limited regularity, and again, it's it's just sort of in one direction. So it's just it's just across this hypersurface and only in the the build in the v direction um, there are spheres sitting at each point the spheres is basically as many derivatives as you want yeah. right. there's also a similar largeness that happens i sort of uh anticipated this a bit um a few slides ago so chris Adulu's solutions have uh the following largeness. so if you take the scalar field in his problem and you look at the d by dv of the scalar field at so this minus one zero. So this is say, this, say this point. This is this is a sphere right here. Right? If you look at the scalar field there, he has some parameter. Um, if he calls k, you could think that um, k is like epsilon squared, or whatever, some small parameter. And which he needs, which uh, okay, well actually he uh, he understands the sharp threshold. But for the sake of this talk, let's pretend that he needed it to be small. Um, if it was small, then this then the scalar field would be um, very large. So similarly to us, there are certain derivatives of the metric, which you, again, the this epsilon, you think the epsilon is like the this twisting of the cone, that is small, that's only size epsilon, but there's something weird about this limit as epsilon goes to zero, because once you take a derivative away from the cone, we have something size one over epsilon. In particular, it's a singular limit as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and again, this, this is what you're very afraid of, of course. All right, and then there's sort of a little caveat, of course. So for the Einstein vacuum equations, um, we have this BV theory of Christodoulou, and so you can sort of, you know, his solutions are solidly in that. Um, in vacuum, we don't. There's not sort of a full, complete, um, sort of uh, well, Posenus theory that these solutions that has been sort of you know written up nicely for for these types of solutions. But on the basis of the kind of things that have been done. It's uh, let's say it's a, it's extremely plausible that that, that you that there, you can build some kind of a uh, a well posed in this theory for for something that's in fact much rougher than than these solutions. We're not we're nowhere sort of near where you would naturally think the threshold for well posed in this is. And let me just cite for example, um, work of Jonathan and Igor on on impulsive waves, which can well at least okay going from say something here to you know a little up like this, you can do that with very nasty. You, there you only need um, say these, DV, you know, so our DV derivatives are holder continuous, they just need it to be an L2. All right, so of course you'd want some theory which goes to the axis. Maybe you need some stronger condition than L2 probably, but certainly being holder, um, one expects that is more and more. Than um, that's that, that's sort of regularity. Um, all right, now uh, let me do a brief discussion of the nature of the singularity. Um, all right, so, and again, it's useful to compare with Chris Adulu. So there's sort of a standard way we do these comparisons. We, we compare these, again, if, you know, if you're not familiar with this notation, it's not too important exactly what this is, but but if, 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 if you are familiar with the double null notation, it's, it's standard to com compare the outgoing shear with say the dV derivative of the scalar field and the ingoing shear with the du derivative. And if we do that, we get excellent agreement with sort of Chris Adulu. So Chris Adulu's scalar fields and his naked singularity solutions, they blow up logarithmically. I mean, the derivative is not, is not integrable. Um, similarly, you can find geodesic, null geodesics on this cone going to the origin such that the 
sort of the shear also blows up. It's kind of uh, sort of similar. You can also find sort of Jacobi fields with their, their infinite um, tidal forces. You can, I mean, you can find Jacobi fields which blow up. Um, all right, so this, this is what uh, Spiros was asking me. This is why it sort of, it, it certainly um, feels a bit like a C0 singularity, even though there's not, a, it, it, I think it's actually quite interesting to, to, form, to, to uh, formalize that more. But anyway, um, another thing you can do, you can also look at the hockey mass. Um, so in Christodoulou solutions, um, in, in Einstein's scalar field system, the hockey mass is a very important quantity. This is some kind of, again, if you're not familiar with it, it's, um, it's, it's a natural energy in the problem. And if you take the hockey mass, at a, of a, this is an energy of a sphere, of the stuff contained in a sphere. If you divide by the area of the sphere, that is a scale invariant. So that's some kind of invariant notion of energy. For his solutions, when you, you look at the spheres around the singularity, no matter how small they get, they're always size epsilon. So this is some kind of energy concentration in, in Christodoulou solutions. You could do a similar, there's a similar calculation you can do here. And again, the sort of the numerology of it is, is basically the, the same. Um, even though again, and you have to be a little careful because in um, outside of spherical symmetry, kind of hockey masses and principles, you know, if you change your foliation, things can change. But anyway, the, the, you can draw there are analogous computations that, that, that you can do. Um, all right, and like I said, this is all sort of formally consistent with some kind of C0 type singularity. Um, questions? Um, okay, so let's, um, in the, the time that remains, so I think, yeah, I have time. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. You mentioned you solve inside the cone. Is, is a uniqueness, I mean, within some class, the solution is unique? No, you. Well, I mean, there's not really, okay, the, at some point, there's some system of well-posed PDs that's solved, but that's, uh, yeah, but there's no, nothing remotely close to any kind of ge actual geometric uniqueness statement. No, it, it doesn't follow from this stuff. So there could be others. So there could be yes. others. Um, I mean, like I said, even the much simpler problem of that, where you have the sort of a trivial cone, that the flat thing is unique, I don't sort of really have, I mean, I just believe that that's true, but I don't have a theorem that says that. That presumably is a much easier problem to understand. Um, does that make sense? I, I'm saying you're, you're asking me if I, I put this some complicated geometry here and I fill that in, is that unique? But I'm saying if you put something trivial here to prove that the, the trivial thing is unique, I, that is also- yeah, But important. imposing some requirement on the smoothness up to and including the tip. Up to and it, well, none of these things are- that's the point. So, yeah, okay. Wait, it's smoothness in the okay, but in the, with the non trivial geometry, nothing's everything's going to blow up at the right. tip, no matter what. Okay, but you just said because if you put trivial data, then I don't know about uniqueness. Yeah, know. okay. It, it's, it's not interesting if you require that this is okay. okay yeah, yeah. No, okay. sure. Yeah, yeah, if you require smoothness, then it's then it's, then it's easy. Um, anyway, so let's, um, in the last few minutes, let me let me discuss some aspects of this. All right, so um, let me, so I'll sort of say briefly something about the exterior problem, briefly something about the interior. Obviously, I will suppress a lot of details, but I'll say what I think, to me, what I think of as the, the, main, the main aspects. Um, all right, so the most important thing is this, is going to be the shear. Again, if you don't, you're not familiar with this, some, there's some component of, of, of the metric. It's satisfied, okay, there's some particular um, equation that satisfies whatever it's some, Double null. All right, but what? Um, okay, again, if, if if that doesn't have meaning, that's fine. What you should you'll just have to believe me is that when you plug in, if you assume that the uh, space time is self similar, so you plug in the you know the, this chi hat at, instead of being v and u, it's like a v over u, some power outside. You do all of those computations. Um, what pops out, in some sense, to leading order is an equation which looks like this. So there's a um, Right, so you get, um, and then I'm going to restrict it to, to u equals one for simplicity. So I, so let's call, so let's say that this is some hypersurface coming this way. I'm looking at, there's, there's sort of a, there's some part of the metric which would normally have an equation sort of along these null hypersurfaces, but somehow because of self-similarity, I plug it in, I do some algebra and I get some a strange equation because there's a V d by dV, which of course vanishes at v equals zero. So some kind of weird equation but along u equals minus one. And this, I claim you already, you can see sort of the most important things that are going on um, just from the point of view of this equation, all right? So 
so somehow to be the order, this part of the metric will be described by some some tensor, this is called the bar theta, which satisfies this, this, this degenerate sort of transport equation. There's some right-hand side. You should think that the right-hand side is part of your data and that it's size, say, epsilon, right? Or epsilon is small. Okay, so let's um, try to unpack this. Okay, so first thing that turns out, right, so I do a little fast. So there's all this sort of, there's a, this is some Lie derivatives, like some vector field. I haven't really told you anything about it. There's all these lower order terms. First thing that uh, turns out that you can rewrite this equation in the following form is the V, di B, v D by DB. Then there's a kappa. This was this parameter, small parameter kappa I introduced, the, the twisting. And then there's, then you can package all the other stuff. It turns out to be an anti-symmetric operator on, um, with respect to the, the, the sphere. All right, so that's, that's kind of nice. And again, let me remind you, kappa turns out to be about size epsilon squared. So the right-hand side is size epsilon, kappa size epsilon squared. All right, so what's the point? So the first thing that you can see in this equation is you can restrict to V equals zero. And um, so the V D by DV term, say, goes away. And you get something immediately, which is sort of disturbing, which is that, um, well, you just look at this. You see that the best that you can hope for, because the right-hand side is size epsilon, this lower order term is only size epsilon squared. It seems like, in general, this theta is going to be size 1 over epsilon. Because, right? you know, for example, you could have something in the kernel of this anti-symmetric operator. So the best you can do is just divide both sides by alpha. Right? Um, so that looks horrible. That's the largest, and that, and this, th this is what in Christodoulos there's a similar thing. This is that the, the derivative of the scalar field is enormous at v equals zero. Um, however, the key realization is that nevertheless you can find solutions to this, which even though they're going to be big at v equals zero, um, once they, once you leave, once you go away from v equals zero, they become small, right? Um, and so, in particular, satisfy some estimates. That okay, so maybe you put some log here to be consistent with the fact that they're blowing up in V, but otherwise you you, you can put an S, right? And 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 I mentioned this work of, of Igor and Jonathan. That, that's very important in the, the many works of people doing the Einstein equations. We know there's something where we're very we have very good experience dealing with things which are epsilon times something which is sort of singular at a, on a null hypersurface like this. And, and in fact, you could you could put something much worse here. If it was, it might even be okay if it was an L two, but this is just log. So that, that's this is this is really good from the point of view of controlling the solution. One difficulty here, a very important difficulty, which I won't talk about, is um, sort of if, if there were no, if this was really just an ODE, this you well, you could just solve it. This would not be a big deal. It's very difficult to control the angular derivatives here. Um, and that's sort of one of the most technical parts of the, the argument. So again, so in the ODE case, it, it's to see what's going on. The easiest thing is just to note this. This equation has this solution. You just check, and you can see. So when v is zero, it's size one over epsilon. When v is away from zero, and then epsilon is small, it, it becomes size epsilon. Okay, so that's that's the exterior. And um, I think I have a few minutes still. All right, so let's talk about the the interior. Um, all right, so the key difficulty here is that well. It turns out that this, I put a question mark here because I was anticipating the fact that this, this is actually not quite true. So it turns out because of this twisting of this field, of the field of, of, oh, I didn't write, of the vector field K, the, um, you don't have a clean transition from space-like null time-like. In fact, there are many points because it's twisting around this null cone, the, the vector field K is space-like on lots of points on this cone. So when you go inside, there's some points that are going to be space-like still. So that means that this is not an elliptic problem. It's at uh, best a mixed elliptic hyperbolic problem, right? All right, so that's sort of a little annoying. Um, okay, so like I said, here's sort of the formula. So the point is you can compute the norm of this vector field. And, and the key thing is, so you see if this, if this B vanishes, if this vector field B, which this is measuring, this is the twisting. If somehow the B is zero, then that's the not twisted. Then you get this clean transition as V goes from positive to negative. The, the norm of the spectral switch, but if B is there, it sort of makes it not work out. All right. So, okay. So now I will. So, one of the things you have to do is sort of develop some kind of theory for these particular class of mixed elliptic hyperbolic problems that show up. So, of course, there's a lot, especially sort of a long history of these types of PDs in different contexts, I guess, famously in, um, in the uh, search for certain stationary solutions, certain uh, fluid problems. But, um, Right, the particular, but somehow they, when you look at these, the global geometry is very important. And there's, um, 
far as I know, this particular I this particular type of mixed elliptic hyperbolic PD uh, is sort of you have to develop new techniques. Right. But here's a sort of simple, simple model, which suppresses, okay, suppresses many things. But anyway, it gives some, some idea of what's going on. So let's consider our unknown. I'm going to do a sort of a, a, a model problem in two dimensions. So we have a unknown C, it's a function of, of, of V. You can think of that as the V in the actual problem. Say that that's going between minus one and zero. And then I have some angular, uh, sort of think of it as like a circle variable phi from minus pi to pi to the real values. And let's look at this, this second order equation. All right, now I'm going to have a boundary value at V equals zero. That corresponds to, um, well, I said it's, that's, that corresponds to sort of the geometry on this twisted cone. That's the boundary value. And then, okay, of course, there's this issue that everything kind of has to, you know, close up. I have to find a regular, an R equals zero where everything sort of closes up. So um, I'm just saying the actual problem, there are lots of technical annoyances there because I'm working in a double null gauge, which of course becomes, which breaks down there. So, but okay, let's completely suppress that and pretend that I just solved some problem where I put um, psi at V equals minus one is zero, right? Okay. Um, all right. So. The key is sort of the key a priori estimate in this context that that sort of uh, you, it can be explained sort of simply. It's basically you can rewrite the equation a bit. You can pull out this derivative. You can write, you can write it like this. You can multiply by this function epsilon d by d phi plus. Uh, oh, maybe I should have said you, you can check um, that this transitions from elliptic to hyperbolic around v equals minus epsilon. And in fact, this equation is simple enough that you can even sort of it's a lot. You can draw the characteristics and you can sort of. You can, you can analyze it that way. That that is that technique wouldn't work in the, uh, at least not so simply in, in the actual problem. But anyway, um, a more robust way to approach is you first of all you can do this kind of a priori estimate. So you can it's just some multiplier identity. You pick up this some boundary term. Uh, all right, that is what it is. All right, but it's a weird PDE, right? So just that you, just because you have an a priori estimate doesn't give you uh, existence, of course. Um, so to run the existence argument, we do some kind of a lift sort of an elliptic regularization scheme, some, some sense the most, uh, it's quite natural in this setting, right? Because we know in the kind of non-twisted setting, um, you would have, you know, you're, you're close to an elliptic problem. So it's kind of, uh, it's natural to try to approximate by that. So what, what, what you can do, again, in this problem, there are many things you can do. You could, you could just do Fourier series, and, but in the actual, um, the actual problem was sort of closer to what is actually done is you put some smoothing operator, on this part, which makes it, which, which, which sort of uh, makes it hyperbolic, it has some smallness. And then you also, um, instead of putting your boundary data at v equals zero, you sort of move in a little bit and put your boundary data at, at some minus delta. So then you're going to take delta, delta to zero. So this, this, this sort of, this equation is kind of basic, is, is elliptic, is an elliptic operator. So you can apply usual theory. And then the key that you have to check that these kind of estimates make sense for this, this equation. And then you take, take the limit. So that's, Sort of, sort of. Um, all right, or maybe I should. Okay, is there any questions about that? I'm not sure. I think you're in negative time. But, uh, negative time. Continue a little bit. Yeah. Um. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah. I'm so you're about. So you, you are in slightly positive time. All right. Well, let's skip the update. You, re <laughs> you rebooted the time. Sorry. Um. Well, let's close with some some natural. All right. So um. So first of all, let me all the sort of the things that are usually asked. So are these Naked singularity is unstable to trap surface formation. One one expects so. It has something to do with these. Um, I mentioned very quickly that there are some matching conditions when um, when we set up the data here. I, I mentioned that. and sort of so you at a heuristic level you see that if those are violated, then it certainly seems like the construction breaks down. But that's certainly an interesting problem to uh, to to study. Um, are all naked singularities unstable? Well, that's why I don't, I mean, well, maybe the, the more honest version, does this shed light on the instability? Uh, is it reasonable to say this sheds light on the instability problem for naked singularities? I don't really think so. I mean, this is, this is really an example. There's no sense that, that this is representative of a generic singularity, but okay, still, it's an example. Um, right, and is it possible to construct naked singularities with smooth data? I expect so, but that's open. Like I said, that's, first of all, smooth, maybe who cares? C2 is quite interesting. And, but that's already, that's interesting also in spherical symmetry. And I'll, I'll end there.